This podcast is part of the No Phony Podcast Network, the home of independent awesomeness. Accurate by nature, we are a little bit full of ourselves, you know. I really think uh, it's amazing how candid you are about how you were feeling back then. I think that's great. But you can make of this what you will. Welcome back once again to another fine edition of Deluxe Edition, the podcast where we dig into pop culture. I'm Bill Seabold here, as always, with Casey Shearer. Hey, Bill. Why are you wearing that shirt today? Oh, it's the Tyson Roy Jones Jr. fight tonight. I, you know what? I kind of figured. I looked at that. That's his tattoo, his face tattoo. Yeah. That's tonight. Yeah. Yeah, this is a limited edition shirt directly from uh, Tyson Ranch. I love how every episode you wear a different shirt. I mean, you must own... Well, you got to own at least 400 shirts. I have like five. <laughs> so last year I tried to do this thing where uh, I tried to do a thing on Instagram where I wore 365 shirts, uh, one a day, and I made it to 152. So that's, wow. how, many, that's how many shirts I had as, as of last year. I've acquired, uh, I've acquired a few since then. So we'll try again next year. What do you think? That's going to cost you a fortune. <laughs> you know? Hey. Like I always tell my girlfriend, it's better than a cocaine habit, right? I guess. I guess. Do you remember like way back in uh see so see how I said that like kind of like, yeah, I guess it's better than cocaine. Back then, uh, I think it was like, God, it could have been 20 years ago when Taco Bell first came out. They actually had Bullwinkle the Moose was their mascot. And there was some contest. I was in high school. Yes, yeah, so it was early 90s, where if you ate a oh, I'm gonna get this wrong. I hope somebody can remind me what this is because it was fascinating to me. If you ate a taco a day for the whole year or something like that you get a bullwinkle shirt and i love taco bell because i had no money and like you can get fed for a dollar 99 so i was like maybe i'm gonna try to get this bullwinkle shirt and then i went nobody in their fucking right mind would be stupid enough to go for the bullwinkle shirt and then sure as shit my buddy gary comes walking into school hey man i got the bullwinkle shirt i got it i ate 18 billion tacos so he uh, paid even if the, even if he was spending a dollar a taco, he spent three hundred and sixty five dollars for that T-shirt. Basically, yeah, <laughs> he totally fell for it. So that's what you were reminded me of wearing your shirt today. Well, let's kick off, Casey. Today we're talking about Friday the Thirteenth. We've had a Friday the Thirteenth episode before. Uh, I feel like I might have infected you a little bit with the Friday the Thirteenth fandom. You weren't that big a fan until we started doing this podcast. No, I've been getting, uh, I've been diving deep into the uh, 80s and uh, 90s horror genre lately. Yeah. That's great. I mean, it's the best time of my life, the 80s. So that's why I talk about it so much. Yeah, Friday the 13th just has, I mean, to me, it's a, it's a series. It's so much fun. It's kind of low rent. It's kind of, you know, done on a budget. So a lot of creativity goes into these things. And, it, you know, these aren't going to win any Oscars. You know, <laughs> these things aren't award winners. They're just great representations of a good time in the 80s. So that's why I really like going back and and uh, sort of living in that world. Like I have my little hockey mask here. And if I can show you the rest of my wall here, tons of Jason stuff. Like I'm just a big fan of all of it. You know, you're a fan when your wife, who hates the movies, now goes out and buys like she owns like Jason socks. And I'm like, well, why'd you get those? She goes, well, I needed socks. I said, well, why'd you get Jason socks? She goes, I don't know. Cause you like Jason? Like it's totally, it's all over my fucking house. And I was like, oh, okay, this is now I'm starting to feel like a child here with all the, the Jason stuff, but I'm a fan for the people listening who maybe aren't giant Jason fans and Friday the 13th fans and maybe aren't familiar with the, the story. I'm going to run through it. I'm going to try to do it in 10 minutes. There's not a ton of details here, so it shouldn't be that hard. I'm going to pause and talk a little bit more about part five, which is, you know, John Shepard, our guest, he's the star of part five. So don't let me run past that without talking about that a bit. So the story simply goes, and I think it's somewhere around 1980, might be 1979. Uh, Sean Cunningham is a producer. I, I think he even directed it, uh, has this idea for a horror movie, 
hires a guy. Guy's name is Victor Miller. We tried to have Victor Miller on the show. Victor Miller has no showed. What what does your boss say? No show, no call. No call, no show. Yeah. Thanks, Victor. But Victor has since come back and has started a lawsuit with Sean Cunningham. Sean Cunningham's sort of the name. He's the face that's tied with the Friday the 13th franchise. And I'm not a lawyer, but I understand it to be this way. After a certain amount of time, 35 years, I think is the number, a copyright that has been given to somebody else can now be available again to the original artist. So they can say, okay, it's been 35 years. I want that copyright back. And Sean Cunningham's group is saying, well, that doesn't work. It doesn't apply in this case because, yeah, you wrote the script, but you were a work for hire. You were hired by me. So everything you create, your IP goes to me. He's arguing that I was, you know, an artist. This was my creation. I, I basically put it out on loan. The expiration is up. I want it back. So you got to remember that that's only part one. So the rest of the franchise that's now affected by this lawsuit, and the reason we can't have any more nice Jason things is because of this fight. Until they know where this ends and who deserves what, only then will they begin starting to make new content and do uh, maybe a movie. Who knows what's going to come? Going into part two, Victor wants this all this 35 years of back money, but part two has Jason Voorhees in it, but it's not really the character that Victor had thought of, right? Right. So Jason in part one was a kid. He was a kid who couldn't swim and he was a kid who drowned in a camp and the camp was Camp Crystal Lake because it's always been Camp Crystal Lake. The counselors didn't pay attention to the kid who couldn't swim. So when this movie starts, somebody's killing all the counselors. When it ends, you find out that the person killing everybody was Jason's mother. And she was just upset because, you know, they didn't do their job right. So she just goes and she's killing everybody in, at the camp. At the very end of the movie, as one final jump scare, the uh, the last girl, as we call them, the, the, the trope of the last girl, because it was always one woman who seemed to survive these killers in the 80s, called them the last girl. So the last girl was floating in a boat. She's exhausted. She has just beheaded Jason's mother. The movie's over. And a gory, dirty, like I've been living at the bottom of a little lake. Yeah, kind of Jason jumps out and goes, Rawr, and, and grabs the boat. And we kind of walk away from that going, okay, that was just a weird jump scare. And, uh, you know, it was a dream. All right. But now this movie makes a shit ton of money. Now part two, the producers are like, you got to make another. And they're like, with what? Like we chopped the mom's head off. So somebody comes up with the idea. Well, that kid that jumped out at the end. Well, yeah, what about him? Just say he's killing everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now part two is that kid, whether that was a dream sequence or not, which is part of the fight that they're having in court. Cause if it was actually a character, not a dream, how much can Victor actually say he contributed to the growth of Jason? It's all so fucking confusing. And that's why it's taken so long to solve. But in this second one, it was like, we're just going to get this big guy. We're going to put a bag on his head and he's just going to kill people. Okay. We still don't have Jason yet with the hockey mask. Part three comes along. Jason is still, he's just a dude. He's just a dude that's been living in the woods, hanging out. He finds a hockey mask. He kills one of the kids and he takes the hockey mask and he puts on a hockey mask. Like for some reason, he's like, I'm now going to wear a hockey mask. Okay, we'll, we'll buy it. You're now the hockey mask guy. Part four is kind of like a, a, a step up on part three in terms of um, just fun and and horror and scares. And, and some of the cast is even better. There's a, uh, Corey Feldman's actually in this one. So like right before Corey did the Goonies, he did this movie. I don't know where the Gremlins movie fits in, but, you know, Corey was starting to get hot. So he did this movie. And at the end of this one, uh, let me pause. He plays a character named Tommy. OK, I don't think Tommy has. Yeah. Tommy Jarvis is the last name. Yeah. Tommy Jarvis is the character he plays. So Corey Feldman, as a kid, kills Jason in part four. Fucking spoiler. I spoiled it for you. Tommy kills Jason. So when part five starts, which, you know, part five has John Shepard. He plays Tommy in this one. When part five started, they could only get Corey back for a day because he was in between Goonies sets or uh, in between, you know, filming uh, the Goonies. And he's like, look, I can give you guys a day. And they're like, OK, come down. They filmed like one scene with him. They said, thanks, man. And they, you know, he went home and went back to the Goonies. So the beginning of part five has a kind of a cameo from Feldman, but then it transitions over to John Shepard, who's like this older version of Tommy. 
And in this movie, uh, John plays a version of Tommy who doesn't talk. He's kind of shocked. Like, he's very angry. He's very scared. But he's after, like, Jason. Like, he knows Jason's not dead. He knows Jason's still alive somehow. And they end up chasing down this Jason character throughout the whole movie. At the end of this movie, which is why this one's very controversial, they unmask Jason. Casey's got his ears plugged. All of you should have your ears plugged if you haven't seen part five yet. They unmask Jason. They find out it wasn't Jason. It was an Roy. ambulance driver. It was Roy, some dude named Roy. <laughs> he was the ambulance driver of one of the kids that got killed in the beginning. He, the kid was killed by another kid. It was like the guy was like cocaine raging or, or I don't remember what cause he kills the kid. And the, the ambulance driver now wants to take revenge on the entire um, cabins, uh, the, the entire, what am I saying? The entire uh, park yeah. because of this. So Funky people were like, boy. people were like, what the fuck? That was even Jason. So they called that one a new beginning, but I think they were trying to be creative with it. They're like, well, we can't just keep killing this guy. You know, right. like he's got to be dead. Um, move on to part six. The one you saw, the, we interviewed um, Tommy uh, McLaughlin with it. Uh, for it rather and you know he said he, when he made that movie he's like look at this point i gotta figure out something to do with jason i'm gonna revive him he's now gonna be like a frankenstein you know kind of monster and that's how you think of jason now the next one he went to fight a woman who uh had like uh telekinetic powers so it was basically carrie versus jason so that's a pretty good one it's kind of like a, a a superhero fight like you can tell they're starting to get a little bit cheesier as we go <laughs> How did he determine that he was wanted to kill this one particular lady? Was it like, was he sent from the future, like the Terminator or what? <laughs> <laughs> it's, dude, no, but it starts to get this weird. So <laughs> I'm not going to spoil this one for you. This one's actually a good one. It's called Friday the 13th, part seven, the new blood. It's actually okay. a really good movie, really good uh, budget too for the special effects. But it, at this point, they're just like, what the fuck do we do next? So the next one was Jason takes Manhattan. They're like, let's put Jason in New York. But they didn't have enough money to keep him in New York. So like half of it was done on the boat that was getting them to New York. Like the whole movie turned out just bad. There's stories about how this one just fell down right in the middle of being made. Total dog shit. Uh, the next one, they're like, what do we do? Oh, well, how about we send Jason to space? They oh send Jason God. to space. So when you say like, what is he like a Terminator? Yes, they turn Jason into a Terminator. What's it called? Jason goes to Manhattan or Jason in Manhattan? Takes, takes, takes Manhattan. Manhattan. All right. Mm. It should be Jason goes to Manhattan and then yeah. in small print underneath on a boat. On a boat. <laughs> Prepare to be disappointed. I think they filmed one day in actual Manhattan. The rest was in Van in Vancouver, I heard. Wow. Which I guess You're is that, a big place to film Vancouver. You got your uh, two minute warning here. Okay. All right. Well, I'm almost done. So then they did, I'm, I got the order. Uh, it's all out of order now. So at this point, Cunningham comes back. He's like, Hey man, I kind of let my, my thing go. I, I don't, he probably profited off it this whole time, but he wasn't really, it wasn't his project anymore. It was just kind of his characters. They were based on, you know, his, his universe. So he comes back and he goes, well, let's try something really different. All right. Cause going to space wasn't different enough and fighting in Manhattan wasn't weird enough. He's like, why don't we have Jason die in the very beginning? We'll blow him up. And then the spirit of Jason, like a demon will infect other people. OK, and there's a magic there's a magic sword in this one. <laughs> and only somebody from Jason's bloodline can kill Jason. OK, it, it's awful. It's terrible. It, it just didn't work out. At some point, Jason fought Freddy. That's a fun one to just sit and watch. That had they, to be difficult because they're two completely different companies, right? They ended up merging. Oh. Uh, how did it work? I think New Line bought the rights eventually from Paramount to make this movie. Okay. Freddy vs. Jason was actually a movie that had been in production for a long time. I actually provided, I don't know if I ever told you this story. So when I was younger, the internet was still pretty new. Entertainment Weekly magazine had just come out and I had a copy of it. I was a fan of Entertainment Weekly when it first came out. <laughs> And there was an article in there saying, hey, they're making a Freddy vs. Jason movie. And I'm like, what the fuck? That's incredible. I want to be part of this. How can I be? I could write this idea. I know I can come up with a good idea for this. And I sat there for days and I thought of shit. And I wrote them an email and I said, hey, I have a treatment. Like making up words like I'm in Hollywood. Yeah, I have a treatment for Freddy vs. Jason. Would you be interested in reading it? I, I even remember writing in this email. It's very smart. It keeps all the storylines still, you know, as part of this big picture. But it's very uh, psychological, too, because Scream had just come out. 
And everybody wanted a little bit more from their heart now, a little bit more, you know, intelligence. And I got a call back and some guy calls me back and he says, yeah, you know, your, your little treatment, we're, we're interested in it. Are you part of the WGA, Writers Guild Association? I said, I don't even know what that is. I'm a kid. And I swear to God, I remember this as, as clear as day. He goes, don't worry, we'll work our way around that. So I've come to learn that working your way around that means they can take your ideas unsolicited and use them. So the beginning of my story, because I couldn't figure out how to really put Jason and Freddie together because they're from different worlds. I said, well, why don't we take Jason? Why don't we have him in a government facility and they're testing him to see how he keeps coming back to life? The army would probably want to know how to make soldiers that can not die. Right. So I have him in that setting, which is the beginning of Jason X, Jason in space. So Jason they you, I'm convinced they took my idea. I'll tell you even why I, I think it, it happened. So Jason basically busts out and he walks back to Camp Crystal Lake because that's all he knows. He accidentally crosses paths with Elm Street. And that's how I put them in the same sort of spot. When Freddy vs. Jason got canned the first time, they went on and they said, well, all right, that's not going to work out. We'll make Friday the 13th in space. So when I went to see the movie and I saw that beginning, I was like, you got to be kidding. So I, I, I emailed the creator. I remember, I, oh, what was his name? Damn it. Todd Farmer, I think. And I remember saying, where'd you get the idea for the beginning? It was so good. And he told me, he said, Jim. he said, yeah, no, the producers already had the idea. The guy I was talking to. <laughs> I don't have that email to prove it anymore, Casey, because we're talking 10, 15, 20 years ago. But yeah, so I've always wondered if my idea was the beginning of the worst Jason in space <laughs> movie ever made. Wow. That's man. just how Hollywood works, man. It's just that's you know. crazy. So today we're talking uh, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking with John Shepard. What's interesting about John is he's not that known by the Friday the 13th fandom. He's He'll, I guess he goes to conferences, but rarely. Like, I've never seen him around. I, uh, I know a lot of people just say he doesn't come around. He's not into doing or into talking about the Friday the 13th stuff. And I'd always heard that John Shepard came, did the movie, found God, left the movie business, and he's gone. That's what we've all heard. So having John today, when we spoke to him the other uh, – we spoke to him a couple days ago. We're, we're putting all this together today. It was fascinating to hear why he left. It was fascinating to hear, you know, that he looks back on his time now differently than, you know, when he was actually living it, when he was in Hollywood. I love those kind of stories. And I'm really happy to hear that, you know, John stayed in Hollywood and he's, he's still doing some cool stuff. Yeah. And what John's out promoting right now is called Flesh and Blood. And he's actually looking for writers. He's not going to steal their ideas like uh, someone did from uh, from you. Allegedly, 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 I don't want to allegedly. <laughs> it sure smells suspicious. But uh, he, yeah, he's got this uh, short out. It's a six minute short. It's called Flesh and Blood, and uh, it's really good, man. It's a little uh, six minute horror short. Puts him back into the horror genre, yeah. and uh, he's going to be looking for writers for this and. Uh, you can, I think uh, we talked to John about it at the end. Uh, you can email us to get in, in contact with John if you're interested in writing something here for him uh, after you watch the short. Bill, um, I haven't seen the finished product, but did you had did you figure out how to put the short at the, is it at the end of the episode? I haven't been able to figure out how to extract it from Vimeo, All right. which is where it's on. But if it's on YouTube, I'll be able to get it. All right. So if, if it's not at the end of this episode, you can go to uh, Vimeo and just search for flesh and blood and uh it's on vimeo.com and it's a re really good like I, I mentioned it in the uh in the interview but uh i i was i was shook by it it was haunting <laughs> i'm actually uh contributing a script I, i'm going for it i'm gonna try to see if i can't get a, a script stolen so i want to see if i can recreate it <laughs> well i'm dead serious but i'm actually going to try i came up with a whole idea basically watch the movie and they put together this six minutes and they're asking people to write a script around that concept. Sure. I'm in. Awesome, dude. Yeah. That's we'll awesome. Do. I hope you put, I hope you put two podcasters in it. Oh, you know, I have to, I hadn't thought of that. I definitely got to have a cameo. We'll die gloriously. <laughs> I want my head cut off. <laughs> I just want to be sitting here at the microphone. And so when he comes behind me and, 
takes my head off and all you see at the microphone is just my head topple off. You know, it'd be really funny because you're big and you're strong. Your neck, you got like a manly muscle. Like somebody comes to cut your head off and like they can't get it off. <laughs> it away. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> and you're just like, what the fuck are you doing? You get up and beat the shit out of them. <laughs> All right. Enough about us, man. Let's get into the uh, let's get into the interview. All right. This is a good one, man. I, like I said, they keep they, they keep getting better, man. Stop saying it. Just. <laughs> You're going to have to say it every episode if you say it again. (laughs) All right. Check us out on Facebook. Join the group. Deluxe Edition, yet another pop culture podcast, The Group. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Deluxe Edition Pod. We have our own website, deluxeedition.show. We're on Patreon, patreon.com slash deluxe edition pod. And uh, anything else, Bill? No, I think that's it. All right, buddy. This is a good one. Let's get into it. Hey, John. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Oh, that looks like a cool room to be in. Well, it's the man cave, you know? <laughs> All the magic happens. Right on. Cool. <laughs> uh, thanks for doing our show. So you're you're producing stuff now. So I want to make sure that I promote something that is uh, near and dear to you. What should I, should I bring up uh, Flesh and Blood? Yeah, you can talk about that. That's in development. We're looking for a screenwriter to um, write a vehicle for this young director I work with quite often. He doesn't want to write it, but he's very accomplished in terms of directing. So Flesh and Blood, you can go to uh, fleshandbloodmovie.com to see that. Our other film that's out right now is um, Emmanuel. That's about a, that's a documentary we did down in Charleston about a a white supremacist that shot nine members of a black Bible study, Barry Stephan Curry and and uh, Viola Davis and Mariska Hargitay from Law & Order. So I do docs and features and then a lot of development. Um, you can see uh, Emmanuel um, on Stars or Amazon Prime or pretty much any major carrier. But yeah, those are the two things I'm doing of, uh, of late. So I saw Flesh and Blood. It's six minutes long or so. It's not yeah. very long. So how are you using that to turn into something else? I'm not really sure how that process works. You know, uh, what's interesting is, so it's the pandemic, right? So we have a a shutdown. We're all in quarantine. Nobody's supposed to be working. And I have a young director. I I love to work with um, young energy and people that are creative. And this kid came out of USC and he said, you know, I want to do something. I want to do something during the pandemic. What can we do? I've got a free house. And I said, why don't you write something and we'll, we'll go shoot it. Of course, he knows my history, my checkered past and the Friday the 13th, which I've never delved back into really. But he said, I want to do something sort of an homage to the exorcist or those cool thriller or horror films of the seventies. I want to shoot it that style. And I said, great. So I helped him produce it. And then, um, as we were kind of doing some retakes and reshoots, he goes, hey, hey, would you mind being in it? And I said, well, I don't really, I haven't really <laughs> been in that genre for you know a long time now. He said, well, I'd love you to play a part. I said, okay, well, well tell me what you want me to do. I need you to shave your head. I'm like, shave my head. Well, my head's pretty much already shaved, but okay. And he goes, and grow a mustache. I'm like, well, I'll see if I've got COVID. Okay, I've got the time. I'll see if I can grow a mustache. So I grew the mustache, shaved the head, and then I showed up. And all of a sudden, he's got this part for me where I'm a priest. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I don't know if I want to play a priest. But the long story short of it, it, it really turned out well. And so it's just a germ of an idea that he had in his head. And he said, let's shoot the six-minute trailer, and then let's interview screenwriters and see if we can't find somebody that will write the actual full-length feature for me to direct. I'm like, that sounds cool. Kind of break the story in the room or get some script sam- samples or meet some young people that are familiar with the horror genre, uh, but can elevate sort of what we want to do. So that's kind of how that came about. That's excellent. How come you never delved back into the horror genre? You know, it, <laughs> it was a weird time in my life. I came to Los Angeles, uh, 17 years old, grew up in the Midwest. And there's two things I swore I'd never do, you know, like I'm not going to do lame, cheesy Christian films, that's for sure. And I'm not going to do slasher pictures, you know, I'm just not. And that was early, you know, gosh, 80s. And of course, you know, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. So <laughs> the first film I get offered is a film called Repetition. I'm like, Repetition? What's, oh, I play a guy coming out of an insane asylum. It's like Boo Radley and To Kill a Mockingbird, which, by the way, was played by Robert Duvall. And I'm thinking, I'm Robert Duvall. And then after five or six callbacks, they say, by the way, this is actually not repetition. It's a, uh, 
a franchise called Friday the 13th. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never seen a Friday the 13th. You want me to do one? Yeah, yeah, you're the you're you're the good guy. You kill Tommy and then you know, who knows where it will lead from there. And I was like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. By that time I was hooked, you know, I was into it. And um, they set up a screen for me because I honestly had never seen a Friday the 13th. I knew what it was, of course, Jason, hockey mask and all that kind of stuff. But I went to see part four at Paramount and they set up a private screening. So in these days you think, oh, they're going to show you on a DVD or TV. We didn't have DVDs. We didn't have, the film had just been out. So they set up a massive cavernous screening room for me by myself to watch Friday the 13th part four. So I, of course, being a method actor, I went in character. I'm in a trench coat. I'm all, you know, I'm just not talking to anybody. And I sit in the front row to watch Friday the 13th part four with Corey Feldman. About mm, about 20% of the way into it, I got freaked out. The music, you know, that Harry Manfredini soundtrack, you know, I was, I'm sitting in the back, man. I'm sitting near the exit. It's fun when you see it with a group and it's a party and everybody's yelling and screaming. When you watch that by yourself in a 300 seat theater, it's spooky, man. So that's how I, I first got exposed to the whole uh, thing. And I went, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to be really good at it. I want to take it seriously. I want people to take me seriously as an actor and not just dismiss it as, oh, yeah, you know, cheesy cornball, whatever people's impression of the genre was. I So I actually um, went and volunteered at Camarillo State Mental in uh, Institution for about a month before I did the role. And I really took it seriously. And I decided if I'm going to do this, I got to fully commit. And so it was a great experience, actually. I really uh, I don't regret a, a moment of it. But after I did it, I was kind of like, OK, check, did that. I'm moving on. And um, when I got part six, they sent me the script. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. There's no continuity between Tommy and five and Tommy and six. Suddenly I'm like a normal. What? So. I, for about a half a beat, said, oh, well, maybe I could. And even as I was saying, maybe I could do this. I was like, nah, this is, this is not what I set out to do. So I'm going to leave the business. I'm, I want to do, I don't know. I thought I was, you know, like I said, Robert Duvall. <laughs> so if I can't be Bobby Duvall, I'm going to leave the business. And I left for a little while, moved out of my uh, house in Malibu and living the, the high life of being a, a Southern Californian actor and in from the Midwest. And I, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to be a minister. So I went for about uh, a heartbeat to a seminary where you had to sign an agreement that you wouldn't go to R-rated films. Of course, my R-rated film, Friday the 13th, was playing in the drive-in across the street, which nobody knew. <laughs> but uh, while I was in seminary, um, I would meet at, um, I had a girlfriend I was dating out in Pasadena. We would meet halfway between us on Sundays at a church in Burbank. And an actor comes up to me and he goes, Hey, you're an actor, right? And I said, no, I used to be, I you know, did some stuff. He goes, no, 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 I've seen you and stuff. You're good. I, I mean, you'd be really good for a part I just read for. I bet I don't get it, but you will. I, I think you'd get it. And long story short, it turned out to be <laughs> a lame, cheesy Christian film, which I also swore I'd never do, but it was a fantastic role that took me to Holland. And I shot over in the Netherlands for three months and they flew my girlfriend over. We ended up getting married and I've been married for a long time now to that beautiful woman. And it's, it's just been an amazing, you know, like I said, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans and never say never. <laughs> Have you paid any attention to the, the fandom now and where it is? You know, I didn't, I have to say, I didn't appreciate the level of commitment fandom around the franchise until I got some distance from it. At the time, again, I was in Strasbourg and studying method acting, and I was thinking, you know, I'm the next Robert De Niro, and if I can't do that, I don't want to do it. So I didn't really appreciate how great Friday was and how, what an amazing legacy and all the people that came out of that franchise. So now, of course, I'm more aware of it. And I, I didn't go to conventions. I didn't go to any signings or anything for years and years and years. And finally, somebody said, you should really go and see it's really a, a, it's kind of a cool thing. And when I first convention I went to, I was just blown away. By the way, the fans are amazing. They, they know the history, they know the lore. Some people drove uh, literally 13 hours to, you know, I really, I've met all the other people. I wanted to get your autograph. I'm like, really? Who am I? I'm nobody. No, no, no. This was an important time in my life. I was 13 years old. I said, the film was rated R. I, well, my brother and I saw it and he was eight. <laughs> you start to realize. <laughs> 
people enjoy, it was a, it was a roller coaster ride, you know? And, uh, I have a new appreciation and respect for the fans. And also I've met a lot of people that have said to me, you know, Hey, the work was good. And I, I was always kind of embarrassed because I told all, all my friends in Chicago, oh, I'll never do this. I'll never be in that. And then I get out there and I do it and they all harass me. But now I go, wow, that was some of the best work I've ever done. And also some of the most love I've ever experienced is from the fans of fans of Friday. So, uh, it's, uh, it's really turned my, opened my eyes, if you will. We had somebody on Casey, I don't remember who it was, but they had said that they knew that Quentin Tarantino's favorite movie of the series, because he's a fan, was was your movie. I mean, there's no. there's impact. That's what, yeah, that's what I heard. I like that from him. You know, it was funny that you would say that. We, uh, we met Quentin because we were in, um, the first film I ever produced was a movie called, um, what was it called? Um, Eye of the Storm. And we had no money. And, um, you know, no money. We had a half a million dollars, which is a lot of money. But in those days, it felt like no money to make a movie. And we were doing posts at a place called Weddington Sound. And I'll never forget, in the editing bay next to us was a guy making a movie called, uh, I think it was Reservoir Dogs. And we were like, well, that looks pretty violent. <laughs> and it turned out to be him. And we were like, wow, we're in the same facility as now. Of course, I look back and I go, Quentin Tarantino, awesome. But it'd be cool to find out if he was really interested in the genre and the movie and was even aware of it because we edited right next to each other on the first film I ever produced. All right, we'll try to get him on. I, I don't think we're big enough yet, but uh, we'll definitely write down that question. Well, we'll tell him I'm a fan. Like, <laughs> maybe, maybe he'll come on if he knows yet. Sure. <laughs> That's great. And I remember, you know, one of the things that I think works, uh, it still works for me watching these movies. First of all, I was a kid. I'm 45 now. So I was, you know, a lot younger when they came out. And they're, they're, it's fun to be scared. So I remembered the movies. As I got older, I started to appreciate uh, what they really were. In a sense, they're, there's comedic moments, but there's also this yeah. kind of revenge movie aspect in which this bully runs around, he gets a couple people, and then finally somebody at the end comes and takes out the bully, and it's sort of a revenge movie in that way. So characters like Tommy, we remember yeah. characters like Tommy. Yeah, it's funny because I got to, I mean, that was a great role for me. I mean, he, Tommy knew, you know, he was into masks and he didn't talk. I'm, I'm like the lead in this film, but I have no lines. They're like, yeah, yeah, you're very, which is totally opposite, as you can probably tell from my personality. So it was very hard to sort of really do a good job with that movie because I wanted to be super friendly to everybody on the set. But I had talked to a buddy of mine. Uh, he's now a well-known writer, director, and has done a lot of stuff, but named Mike Hitchcock. And and Mike said, John, if you're going to take this role, you really got to take it seriously. Do a good job. Don't dismiss it as like, uh, I mean, go volunteer at a, a state mental institution. Go study mask making. Learn a little bit of karate. And one of the funnest things was really doing the physical action stuff in Friday and actually getting to, you know, beat on somebody and flip somebody and and. I'm still friends to this day with my stunt double and the, the guy that I had a flip, Eddie Matthews, Steady Eddie, we called him, from that movie because it was such a great opportunity to be outside of who I am and really stretch sort of as an actor and as a human. And also, like I said, I respect the work and the commitment. And when Danny Steinman, who directed it, um, I mean, he took it very seriously too. It was not, I always had this feeling that, oh, horror films aren't taken seriously. And yet when you saw artists really even the stunt department the makeup department the sound everything that goes into it the music people cared they wanted to be good they wanted to be scary and it really worked for me because uh i think maybe you've read or i've talked about it before in some programs i didn't talk to anybody for about two and a half weeks the first two and a half weeks of production i just stayed in character i decided i'm gonna do this people got to be a little bit, think I'm a little off. And they did. <laughs> they this, guy, this guy's something wrong with him. He doesn't, he's not very friendly. doesn't talk. I just look down. Yes. No one word answers, but it was a, a really good experience. Uh, and of course we were shooting in a barn in the rain all night. So I was always wiped out anyway, or hyped up on coffee. So it was a, it was a really good experience as an actor, but it also, I think the, the work that went into it, the prep, it's evident and people, the way they related to me on film and off screen uh, is evident. They, they kind of stood back a little bit like, okay, just give this guy his space. He's a little out there. And that worked for the Tommy character. And 
you know, I am the good guy. I get to kill J- quote unquote Jason. That was cool. Um, some people diss the movie because, oh, it's not the real Jason. It was an imposter. And some of that stuff I read and I kind of got, oh, uh, I'm the bastard child of the franchise. People don't like Tommy Jarvis. Oh, well, well, I'm moving on. Now I look back and I go, that was really, I mean, look, there was a c- continuity of Corey Feldman and then me and then Tom. It was kind of cool to see that, um, this could have, you know, could have been a career if I'd wanted to go on with it or, but gosh, that franchise continues to live, right? How many did they do? 13? I don't know. It's just incredible. Yeah. I think they're just shy of 13. And, okay. and I want to pass it over to Casey and the fans. Cause I've got a billion questions for you. You started to touch on some of the answers that I know the, the, the fans have asked, but yeah, thanks again for doing this. Go ahead, Casey. So a lot of the questions, uh, we got, uh, we actually were trending on Reddit at a moment because I post, I always post fan questions and uh, yeah, yeah, we were actually trending because of uh, your name. So we have a lot of fan questions here for you. Uh, Here's a few that we got a bunch of the, the people want to know, how did you get so shredded for the movie? Ever since I, again, I didn't know it was a Friday the 13th. So when they called me in, they say, you're auditioning for the lead in a film. It's a thriller. He doesn't talk. He's Boo Boo Radley in To Kill a Mockingbird. But, you know, he's been in this uh, asylum. So I started working out the minute I heard I had an audition. And one of the things I did even for the audition was I thought, if I go in and I'm just um, John Ritter from you know Three's Company and I'm Mr. Nice Guy, I'm never going to get this role. But if I go in and I don't look anybody in the eye and I'm ripped and I'm not who I am, I'm not boy next door, which is what I always got cast as. If I come in and I'm somebody else, maybe maybe I'll get this role. So the day of my audition, and again, I had several callbacks. There, it was I remember it was in a building that had to be up on like the 10th floor. I was in the fire escape running up and down 10 flights of stairs, working my butt off for the audition. And then when I went into the audition, when they, you know, I kept checking in, they'd say, no, they're not ready for you yet. And finally they said, come on in. I took off my, I think I was in a trench coat again and a sweater and took all this stuff off, put it in the, in the, <laughs> the fire stairwell. And I went into my audition, I sat down and I just started sweating and I did not look them in the eye. And it, <laughs> in my mind, I thought if they don't hire me, they're flipping nuts. Cause I was, I felt good. And I did push ups, sit ups. I ran like a banshee. We were working all night. Even when I was off camera, I would go into my trailer and I'd be doing push ups because I wanted to stay like hyped and on edge and be the person I was not. And, um, I, I wish I had stayed in that kind of shape. That took a lot of work. So it was a lot of fun though. A lot of fun. Do you know why, uh, they didn't bring Corey Feldman back? Were they going for somebody who was a little bit older? Yeah, they. Um, I think Corey had sort of again eclipsed that part in his career, and he was ready to move on. And they were looking to, for Tommy to be a teenager. And then, um, you know, again, I was surprised when he survived to part six that they came back and said, "Do you want to do part six? And at the time, I was like, "I'm a serious actor. I'm, you know, Strasberg and Method and Actor Studio, and I've I've got great designs on Lawrence Olivier." <laughs> so, you know, it was a humbling experience to realize they could immediately recast you without a second thought and just change the yeah it would get anybody to do this but uh again it was um i yeah i don't know exactly why they uh, didn't bring Corey back but you know I've, I've seen Corey at signings and we've talked a little bit and obviously he's a very talented i mean the two Corys were amazing back in the day and just to be a part of that sort of legacy was kind of neat to have that touch to hollywood with him it was pretty cool very cool what was your favorite Friday the 13th that you saw up until uh, your movie? Gosh. Well, I have to go with Kevin Bacon, you know, who launched sort of the franchise, right? I mean, I, I of course, I, I really appreciated part four because it was the final chapter. And I'm, I got to, oh, I'm going to be this kid now in a new beginning. Um, that's either going to go really well or people are going to hate it because it was over. I mean, part four was the end. It was the final chapter. So... Uh, of the franchise, I think I like the original. I like part four, of course, because that launched. And and I have to say, for, for me personally, the work that I did in five is some of my favorite work I've done in anything I've ever been in. Because, you know, I've been on like Laverne and Shirley and Quantum Leap and shows from the 80s and TJ Hooker and, you know, lame stuff. 
but I always looked at Friday as like, I really got to stretch as an actor. And Danny, you know, came to me, Danny Steinman. And the first day of shooting, he said, you know, kid, this is your movie. You may not have the most lines. You may not have the most scenes, but you can make of this what you will. It's your film sort of to either, you know, you could lose it if you, if you don't, if you screw it up. And that gave me a sense of empowerment. And I've had very few directors that have come to me and said, like, empowered me in that way. So I have to say my work in Friday is uh, amongst my favorite stuff I've ever done. Was it a movie that you were sort of worried about? I got to think that, and I was, again, I was young when they came out, but you go from one to two to three to four, all of a sudden it's, this thing is getting bigger and bigger. And now you have five. I mean, that must've been a pretty terrifying job. You know, because I didn't, like I said, appreciate it at the time, I had no idea that the film would make $40 million, which in the day, that's a lot of money. And we made it for nothing. I mean, I think the budget was probably a million or two, you know, I didn't even know. Cause I, I was working for scale, which in actors parlance is minimum wage. It was, it, and my agent was kind of like, well, you could do this, but you know, it's not the best thing for your resume. It's not a bad thing. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis started in horror film and then you know people look at it as a stepping stone to something else and so in my mind because i was blinded my by my egotistical self-centeredness <laughs> of being a, a you know whatever i was early 20s sort of full of myself actor i didn't appreciate the fact that this was a real honor to be a part of this and of course part four had ended the franchise was over. It was the final chapter. Was I going to screw it up? It's like, uh, well, I'm not if I can help it. I'm going to do the best I can to make this, to elevate it, if you will. Um, it hurts even as an actor to read when people don't like it, like, oh, it wasn't a real Friday because the villain was an imposter and blah, blah, blah. But for me, when I got into it, we really got into it to the point where, um, you know, they hadn't written the end and ending to the movie when we were shooting it. So I actually talked to Danny, what happens at the end here? They said, well, we're figuring that out. And so me and Mike Hitchcock, uh, this friend of mine from Northwestern, he and I sat down and said, what if Tommy is hiding behind the door when Melanie Kinnaman, you know, and she comes in and he, and she hears a crash. And I mean, we came up with all that stuff and wrote it and gave it to Danny. And it was funny because I had no idea what it took to write a screenplay. And I had put numbers in the margins, just like in my script. And he looked at the pages I wrote and he said, what are all these numbers? And I said, well, those were the, those were the numbers that were in the script you gave me. He goes, those are scene numbers. They, you can't just put in any kind of numbers. And I was like, oh, well, uh, I, I don't know. And he goes, and what's all this dialogue I, it, with Tommy saying all this stuff? He hasn't talked the whole movie. Now he's got a monologue. I said, well, well, yeah, because he's freaked out. He's like, no. But they ended up using this stuff that Mike and I had come up with, that Tommy's in there, but he's throwing a chair through the window. And she comes in thinking he's escaped. And then the door closes. And there he is. That was Mike Hitchcock cock in me. So uh, it was kind of fun to be a part of that. And I went to Timothy Silver after it was all over at Paramount. And I said, you know, we might might be interested in uh, writing the next one. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't think he ever took that seriously. But it was at that time I realized we had an impact. We're doing something kind of cool. And it's fun to be a part of the family. So very cool. So you mentioned working with uh, Danny Steinman. That's uh, one of our fan questions here. Dr. Dan Chalice wants to know what stands out about working with Danny Steinman? Well, like I said, it had to be that moment where he empowered me because obviously, look, Melanie Kinnaman's a star. She's the young, sexy, attractive female in the movie. And so she got a lot of attention. And I'm this quiet sort of, you know, enigma that's you know, glasses wearing, uh, quiet guy. It, 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 what was cool again is Danny took it seriously. And, you know, I looked up his resume and he'd done streets of fire or whatever. And he'd done some like soft pornography. And I was like, Oh gosh, am I getting into, what am I getting into here? But he was such an actor's director. And again, to say to somebody, kid, this is your movie to, you know, to make it or to lose it. It's kind of, it's up to you how seriously you take this. It, it was, I was like, 
I'm going to kick Jason's butt, man. I'm on, I was on fire to do this film after that. But, you know, it was a lot of spending quiet time in my trailer, not talking to anybody, trying not to be friendly, trying to just stay in the moment. And he respected that. He allowed me to do that. He was very good with the set. Like there was that scene, um, you know, where you've got a love scene in the woods and uh, there's going to be nudity. And he was like, nobody's allowed. We're keeping this very closed tight knit group only who needs to be on that set will be on that set. I thought he was very respectful of the actor's privacy and the time it took me. I mean, if I needed to prepare, it wasn't like, Hey, Shepard, hurry up. It was like, give him the moment, give him the time. And then I'd come in and do my stuff. And uh, I, so I really appreciated and loved working with Danny. He was quite a talent. And, and, and like I said, an actor's director. Cool. Dr. Uh, Dan also wants to know what was your most memorable experience from uh, the film? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is embarrassing, my most memorable experience, because um, I'm trying to stay in character. I'm a method actor. I'm Lee Strasberg trained. I'm at, you know, Stella Adler Institute. I, you know, so I'm trying not to talk to anybody. And Dick Warlock, our stunt coordinator, is the nicest guy you've ever met on the planet. And he's overly friendly. Like, hey, John, so here's what we're going to... He's okay if I call you John? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, Tommy, I'll call you Tommy. Is that better? You know, I mean, he was just like... <laughs> What you're gonna do is you're gonna pick Eddie up. Now, Eddie's gonna jump, so it'll look like you're lifting him, but actually you're gonna flip him and then you're gonna wail on him. And, you know, just explaining everything to me and working with me. And I was just trying to be polite. And I said, how do you know Eddie? That was the only sentence I've uttered in like two and a half weeks. He goes, oh, Eddie, Eddie's up from Arizona. I'm from Arizona. You know, I brought him up because he's a Christian guy. I'm a Christian guy. We're trying to be light on these dark Hollywood sets. And even though this is a horror film, you know, I got the love of Christ in my heart. And I was like, whoa, it's <laughs> like too much information, dude. But he was so exuberant about his faith that I made the mistake of saying, no, I'm a Christian. He said, what? I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. He said, you're... Hey, Eddie, he yells across the set, <laughs> this dude's a born again Christian. Now, I never said I was a born again Christian, but in Dick's mind, that was good enough. And the whole, I mean, it was like E.F. Hutton commercial. The whole set stopped. Everyone looked and I was like, holy crap, I've just been outed. And I've been so quiet and like so intense and everybody's going to think I'm a complete total maniac which they did because that was just the cherry on top that this guy might be like a born again christian oh my gosh but the coolest thing was after that dick and i were like this eddie and i 40 years later whatever it is we're like this and we became friends then sitting around on the set talking about spiritual things and that's why this this new film i worked on i'm kind of excited about flesh and blood it deals with the spiritual dimension and i've always been fascinated by the unseen the invisible and slasher pictures are cool and fun and watching it at the theater with you know 300 people going nuts because of the violence or the scariness or the through but but what's really frightening to me is when there's a biblical cosmology that actually might be true, like there is spiritual forces working in our world, in an invisible world, a domain you can't see. But And I think we've all got that sense that there is. There is stuff going on you can't see. That's what intrigues. And I love talking to Eddie and Dick about that. So that's my most memorable and probably most embarrassing moment was uh, – Crap, I, they all know I'm John Ritter now. I'm not Boo Radley from A <laughs> To Kill a Mockingbird. They know I'm not Robert Duvall. But uh, it was a, a defining moment for me in the film. So you mentioned working with uh, Dick Warlock as uh, the stunt coordinator in uh, some of your fight scenes there. Karate Dad Jr. wants to know, did you have any martial arts training for this movie? You know, I had studied um, karate, karate at uh, Northwestern my freshman year. I just took it because I thought that'd be an interesting. I'm not, I'm a wrestler in high school. I never studied martial arts, but I really enjoyed studying karate. And so when I went to do the martial arts scenes, they did have a guy that was a stunt double that did martial arts. And he walked me through all these scenes and I loved it. And I've actually got the great thing about being an actor is you get to, be somebody you're not right and so i've been in so many different films where i've been a navy pilot or i've been you know a kid coming out of an insane asylum or i've been a, a fbi agent it's fun because you get to i don't have to be that good at martial arts but for 
30 seconds. I have to look authentic. And Dick really worked with me. And then we had a stunt double that I think they shot another scene where he was doing all the same moves I did. And then they cut it together with movie magic. And, uh, you know, my buddies in high school that harassed me for taking a Friday the 13th, there was some newfound respect that, uh, dude, did you, uh, did you like, was that karate or were you like a keto? Or... So, you know, you don't tell them, you make them think, yeah. I've studied. I've studied with them. <laughs> the truth was I studied with Dick Warlock and Eddie Matthews made me look good. That's great. So here's probably our only non Friday the 13th related question. And uh, let's see who right. wants to know. Uh, Dr. Dan wants to know, what was your experience like during the filming of The Hunt <laughs> for Red October? Well, if any of you have seen The Hunt for Red October, it is actually, um, to find me in it is The Hunt for John Shepard. <laughs> I took four quarters of Russian at UCLA because Spanish was full. And I thought, oh, Russian looks easy to get into. <laughs> I'll just sign up for Russian. Well, I actually really enjoyed Russian. And I was sitting in a diner, Greasy Spoon, on Pico Boulevard in whatever it was, the 80s. And an assistant director came in that I knew from another film I'd done. He said, hey, Shepard, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm just sitting here at a men's breakfast. A bunch of actors were all unemployed trying to figure out what to do for the day. He goes, you should come down and meet John McTiernan. I'm doing Hunt for Red October. You don't uh, happen to know Russian, do you? Duh. You know, I knew enough that I said, yeah. He goes, we're looking to uh, hire a, a Soviet Foxtrot pilot, uh, but you have to have a Russian accent or be able to speak Russian. And I said, well, I can do it. And I went down and it was a great experience. I did um, one day only. And uh, back in those days, I got paid a thousand dollars for the one day. That was amazing to me. I'm sitting next to a real Navy pilot works for the U S Navy, but we're both playing uh, Soviet Foxtrot pilots because it takes two people to fly the plane. He actually knew how to fly a plane. So he's got hundreds of thousands of dollars of education. He's getting 40 bucks a day. And me who went to Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler, I'm getting a thousand dollars a day. I'm feeling very guilty, but not that much. And uh, we do the scene and <laughs> it's the craziest thing when you work as an actor one day and they hire you as a day player that's all you get you're done but if they forget to put a clause in there that says drop and pick up if they bring you back which they did they have to pay you for every day you didn't work between the day you work and the day you bring you back so i ended up needing to come back to do another scene uh turns out that uh, john mcturnan was furious because the art director or the set, whoever it was, had not done his homework and put Russian letters on all the controls in the plane. They just take taken the American alphabet and turned it upside down and backwards. So all the Russians on our on our set were laughing their heads off when they saw the movie because it's like this is gibberish. This is nothing. It means nothing. So John McTiernan reshot it, but I got paid for every day in between the day I had worked and the day I had to come back. Poor Navy pilot got another forty bucks. I went to the movie with my wife. I'm all excited to see my big part with my Russian accent. Now, keep in mind, I'm in a helmet and an oxygen mask, <laughs> and I'm out of focus the entire scene. They're on the Navy pilot, and at the very end, they rack focus to my eyes. And <laughs> my wife said, well, at least your name's on the screen a long time, because it was over like that. <laughs> but it was a great experience. And of course, got to work with uh, Sir Sean Connery, although he was down in a submarine and we were dropping depth charges on him. So I actually never met him, but I'm in a movie with him. So that's cool. You have to live out in L.A. to get those kind of opportunities. Like just like you're down. To, I like the way you described it. I was just down. I was in the area and they, my I friend was. came by. Is it really it, it, like that out there? It is helpful to be in Los Angeles, although that was, you know, a long time ago. Now I think you can do films from anywhere. You can be in Dallas or Chicago or Austin or Atlanta and people get jobs and it's best to be a big fish in a smaller pond than to come to LA because everybody comes to LA. So you're sitting in a greasy spoon with 50 other actors that are all better looking, more talented, more experienced, have more credits, more dance, more singing than you do. And I just, Again, I, uh, this is where my faith comes in. It's no accident that I did this, guys. It was like, it, it could have only been God that all these things happened to me. Because when I was back in Chicago, I was so ignorant. I just thought, oh, I'm going to be on TV. Yeah, I'm going to be famous. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, in movies. Once I got out here and I've been through everything I've been through, I'm going, this is impossible. I, how did this happen? It's amazing to me. 
But it was really sort of a divine appointment where I just happened to be several times meeting a guy at church who says, I just read for a role. I'm not going to get it, but you'll probably get it. I mean, what are the odds? Actors don't share movie parts they're up for with other actors. I mean, that was meant to be. So that's where I have to say being an actor and being in the entertainment industry, it has been very conducive to a life of faith, because if you don't believe you'd be depressed, you'd take your life. You'd go like, this is just too, too much pressure and it's too competitive. But I've always been an optimist that like things work out. They come, you know, it all works together for good. I don't know. It's a mystery. It's like Shakespeare in love. It's a mystery. It comes together. And that's been my experience. And I think if you have that attitude, if you're positive about your life, if you're looking for, okay, I'm looking for God to show up here, you find him. But if you have the attitude, nothing ever works out for me. My luck sucks. Every day's Friday the 13th and I'm going to get my butt kicked by Jason. That's what happens to you. <laughs> so you, so I've, I've actually learned that, you know, this Friday taught me a lot about just, um, life is not always what you want it to be. It's not always what it, you expect it to be. And, you know, God forbid you say, I'll never do this and I'll never do that. And so, but it's in the, if you turn over your fate and put it in the hands of a, a power greater than yourselves, often it's better than you could have possibly imagined, but you have to let go and be willing to, okay, I did Friday. I'm leaving the business. Now I'm going to go to seminary because I feel like I've done that. And this is what I'm supposed to do. It took leaving to order you know, suddenly I found that I could be in this industry, not only an act, but now I get to produce. I mean, I never in a million years knew or believed or thought I could be a producer, but it was just kind of funny when you sort of let go and let God stuff happens, but you got to have, you got to have a little faith. How long was it before you worked again after, uh, in, in <laughs> film after Friday the 13th? Sure. Well, the movie, let's see, the movie came out. I went to seminary. I was there one quarter and then I got cast in that movie. Um, so it was literally six months, I'd say. And, but it was funny. I ran out of money cause I was living in Malibu. So I got moved out of there. I moved into North Hollywood, no ho. I took a job at the LA times putting inserts in the Sunday paper and you get paid by uh, how many you did not by the hour i was making about a buck 50 an hour i think i was so slow i was rolling pennies to, to buy stuff to make coleslaw because i was okay i'm going to be a seminary i'm going to be a minister i'm giving it all up for god and my girlfriend at the time was just saying you know you just need to pray and everything will work out and you know amazingly amazingly uh, I said, I can't get married until I've done three things. I got to have a job. I've got to see the world. And I, you know, I've got to have some money in the bank. She goes, okay, let's pray about that. And literally like two weeks later, I'm auditioning for this movie. I'm going to Amsterdam. I have a job and I'm going to have money in the bank. She's like, so what was the problem again? And again, you just, <laughs> it's just, again, I can't say that that was by any of my talent or planning or cause I'm some special guy. I'm not, it really was okay. What do you, I don't know what my hands are open. I don't know where it's going to go, but I'll, I'll move to North Hollywood. I'll get rid of my place. And I'll go to seminary. I, I let go and man changed my life. Very cool. So, uh, all right, let's get back into a little Friday the 13th here. <laughs> sure. Uh, Vince nine twenty six wants to know, <clears throat> is there anything that you could have done uh, differently looking back on your performance and on the movie 35 years later? Um, no, I feel of all the work I've done, that was the one I prepared the most for. I mean, I even felt bad. I was volunteering at Camarillo State Mental Institution and I met some kids, you know, that I was studying for the part. And when I had to go to work, I had to leave and say, guys, I'm not going to be back next week. I've got a job. I couldn't tell them it was a movie or what I was doing, but it was kind of heart wrenching that I'd befriended these kids. And, you know, this is, this wasn't just a movie. These, this is real life. Then I did the film. The thing, what would I have done differently? I think what I might have done differently is not the, the, the work, but the aftermath of promoting it and being involved in sort of um, the continuance. But I, like I said, at the time, I was so full of myself and very prideful of who I was as an actor. I thought I was better than, or in some way, this was beneath me. And I'm, now I look back and I go, what an idiot. <laughs> it's like, I was, I was so lucky to be a part of this. And, you know, I, I'm trying to teach my kids, what do you deserve? What do you deserve? And the answer is nothing. 
I mean, everything I get is a gift. That was a gift. I got all these great relationships. The nice thing is I did get a chance to reunite with Danny and Dick Warlock and Eddie Matthews. And I now have been to some of the reunions and I have done some of the signings. Now I have a new appreciation of the fans who love this. And, you know, I used to think, uh, oh, if this is a very dark part of the industry, it's scary. And I need to stay away from this. I can only do light things. And actually the Friday franchise and horror films in general are great sort of morality tales, as I think was said earlier by Billy. I mean, it is, you know, the, the bad guys get their comeuppance, you know, you smoke dope, you die, you sleep with a girl, you die. There's a sort of black and white morality to it. But at the end of it, it's also not just the work we do, not just the body of work that we have over our life, but it's the relationships that we make along the way that are very defining. So, you know, when I pick projects, I do it for three re reasons. One, for my reel. I want it to be on my reel because it's going to be impressive too for the revenue. I'm going to get paid. They're going to pay me. Well, I really didn't do either of those. That's not why I did Friday the 13th. I did it for relationship. I felt like this is an opportunity to meet with and work with people. I'll never have a chance to sort of, and Danny Steinman is, you know, impressive in terms of what he's done. And I thought I'm going to do something here that will take me outside of my comfort zone. And dang, if it didn't result in something good for my reel, something good that was revenue and relationships. And I was like, that was a win, win, win. So can't fault it now. But at the time I was young and stupid. So I really think uh, it's amazing how candid you are about how you were feeling <laughs> back then. I think that's great. When you decided, OK, I'm, I'm done with this project. Right, Were you right. still there to promote it? I, you said something that made me think that maybe you just kind of cut ties right away. And I'm curious with the production company, if, you know, if Paramount was like, damn that kid, he, he didn't follow through with everything we expected him to do. You know, what was interesting was I kind of felt like perhaps they didn't appreciate my gifts and talent that they could replace me at the drop of a hat with somebody else and just call him Tommy, that they could pay me just scale because this is a, this franchise stands on its own. We don't really need you. We're doing you a favor. So part of my experience at the time was I was reacting to how I was feeling treated, which only Danny was the guy that said, this is your movie, kid. The rest of the producers were like, this is a payday. This is a movie that's going to make a ton of money. This is, uh, you know, it is what it is. It's we're not going to win any Oscars here. We're not making any pretenses. And I didn't like that. I want to be in stuff that I look at and I go, I'm proud of that. That may, And I didn't have that sense. It could have been totally wrong. I'm not saying Timothy Silver or, or, you know, Mancuso or any of them had that attitude, but that's what I read into it was they don't appreciate all of my years of study, my sacrifice, my volunteering at the state mental institution. <laughs> they don't realize what a gift I am to them. But the cool thing was um, that doesn't matter what other people think of us it's really not, I'm not performing for them. And my value doesn't come from whether they thought I was great or whether they thought I was a pain in the ass. You know, I mean, it really was, I'm about doing the best work I can for the audience. Who's your audience? And that's a great question. I think all of us need to ask, who's your audience? You know, I want to impress my girlfriend. I want to impress God. I want to impress my peers in high school that I was good. But when you get into seeking that approval for validation, that's when you get in trouble. And I think because I didn't have that from Paramount, because I didn't have that from the producers, uh, because I was working for minimum, I was feeling unappreciated and it made me pissed. But I use that in the acting too. I decided I'm, this kid is angry and he doesn't feel validated. And so it worked for me as an actor. And I think sometimes we get paralysis of analysis in life where we think everybody's against us. And that can either crush you or you can use it to say, no, no, I'm going to use this to fuel my passion to be better. My best revenge is success. So I'm going to be the best damn Tommy Jarvis they've ever seen, better than Corey Feldman. But, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I At the time, I had... <laughs> I have no idea if any of that was rooted in reality. It was just my experience as an insecure actor. I had something to prove. I had a chip on my shoulder. So, all right. So, uh, all right. Some of these, uh, some of these Reddit names are pretty uh, strange. In the Grotto wants to know: Was the ending a surprise for you during filming, or did you know going into it that it was going to be a uh, faux Jason? Everything was a surprise. I had, like I said, the ending wasn't really written. Uh, that part was that it was a faux Jason, but the fact that I would put the mask on at the end, that was a big surprise. And I was kind of like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I, 
am I becoming possessed? And that I struggled with that because that's not who I wanted Tommy to be. I wanted him to be, you know, a, somehow have uh, transcended uh, the film and the franchise. And the, so, no, the, the faux uh, Jason wasn't a surprise, but the, oh, you're going to go on to the next part and you're going to become Jason. That was a huge thing. And I, I really kind of struggled with it at the time because I was st starting to think, do they want me to do the next one? Am I going to, is this going to be a career for me? Am I going to be known as, hmm. And, you know, as an actor, you're thinking, oh, I want to be in Top Gun. I want to be Tom Cruise. I want to be Leonardo DiCaprio. Is this the path? And so it was a very, you know, again, you can't really judge with any objectivity at the time. Only in retrospect can I look back now and go, oh, I could have really gone for this and I could have written the next one or I could have been in the next one or I could have created a, another version of, a, a, of this sort of in this genre, which I'm doing now with flesh and blood that I'm really like excited about because I'm not being paid to say somebody else's lines. I'm actually writing the lines. I have creative involvement and participation. That's the hard thing about an actor's life is you're always asking for permission to do your job. Will you please put me in your movie? Will you please let me do what I do? And like life, it's humbling to have to beg to do if, you know, it's like if you're a bird, it's not arrogant to fly. You're supposed to fly. People should let you fly. But they're like, well, we don't know if we like the way you fly. You're not really the right bird we were looking for. You're a little too short. You're a little too tall. You're a little too fat. You're a little too ugly. You're too good looking, whatever it is. And you have to get past that and sort of say, you know what? I am who I am. I'm the best me that I can be. And so if they get it, great. If they don't, they're nuts. They should have hired. They're crazy. I, I'm there flipping nuts because I'm good. And once you get to that point, you don't care anymore. That's when you start to succeed and work. And so, um, I don't know where that question was coming from, but that's, um, <laughs> that's my answer to whatever you asked me. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great answer. Yeah. We definitely did go a little off topic, but I, you could keep on going. I mean, you're like a motivational speaker. Maybe you do that on the side you're really, <laughs> maybe I should, you know, I haven't, like I said, done a lot of this stuff, but when you guys said, Hey, would you be on the podcast? I just finished a flesh and blood movie. And I thought, you know, I want to promote this. I want to talk to people about the opportunity to be creative in this genre. And somebody wrote me the other day and said, Hey, I do, what is it called? Fan. It's basically fan created, a fan created film. Uh -huh. right. about, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they said, well, yeah. And of course this is again, blows my mind. I had no idea, you know, it's like, what does that mean? It means we do it kind of pro bono, but we kind of, uh, extrapolate from the film and would you be in it? And it's like, yeah, I might do that. If the script's good, you know, it's not about for me a payday or I've already got the real and the revenue and the relationships, but now I also want to empower others. And like this young director, Brian Ivy from USC said, I want to make something in the genre that it's an homage to films of the eighties and late seventies. Like the, I'm like, dude, how can I help you? How can I help you succeed? What can you learn from what my experience is? How can you stand on my shoulders and go farther than I did? And also not embarrass yourself, you know, elevate the genre, do something better. Don't don't just be about trying to profit or draft off of like my partner for 15 years in the film industry uh, was the producer on uh, passion of the Christ. Now he did brave heart and we were soldiers and what women want all these Mel Gibson movies, but he did the passion of the Christ, pretty darn good movie. I don't want to make a rip off of that and slap a bumper sticker on it or a Christian fish and say, Hey, we just did a $2 million version. That's the sequel. It's got, if we're going to go back into that genre of religious, you know, imagery, and I want it to be better, but that's kind of the gold standard there. And in many ways, Friday or nightmare on Elm street or scream, they're the gold standards in this. So if I'm going to do something, I want it to be unique, innovative, different, or creative. I don't want to just draft off and do a low budget version of Friday the 13th, a new beginning, you know? So that's the hard thing is to encourage people to do something. And that's, what's great about youth is people come up with all kind of crazy I, new stuff that I would never think of. And that's what I want to participate in is that's a great idea. How can I help? Yeah. Some of those uh, fan films on uh, that you can find on YouTube are, are pretty damn good. The, the vengeance. And they just came out with another one. I think that just came out this, uh, this year it was called uh, "Never Hike in the Snow." I oh, right, right, right. There's supposed yeah. to be another three of those coming out. Yeah, that actually answers one of the uh, fan questions here. Sort of. Uh, pizza rolls are the best. Wants to know: uh, Would you come back in the future uh, for an F thirteen movie if this uh, lawsuit ever gets wrapped up? 
uh, I will never, ever say never again, because the minute I say, no, I'd never do that. <laughs> it's like, boom. But my uh, feeling is, look, I think, again, you have to approach life with an open hand and an open heart and ask really do what do I deserve? And the truth is I don't deserve to come back in that. But if there was something where I felt I could contribute or be a value add, or we could do something that wasn't just treading over, you know, already well-trodden ground, I'm open. I'm open, but what I don't want to do is just sort of do a cheap imitation of stuff I've done before any more than Steve McAbee. wants to remake the passion of the Christ. It's like, once you do Braveheart, you're not going to do a whole bunch of Irish movies about guys in swords and saying, you want to, what are we going to do next? Something new, something different. How can it be? So the answer to your question is I'm open. Cool. Well, yeah, hopefully, hopefully they get this uh, lawsuit wrapped up one of these days and people can move on with their Friday the 13th lives. Uh, <laughs> All right, so uh, Evil Wayne wants to know, were there any actors or actresses that were a pain to work with in, uh, and not just Friday the 13th, but I guess any, uh, any, any role that you were in, any uh, film, TV? Who has this question? This is like the greatest question ever. I'm, I'm buying some time for you to think, John. <laughs> Evil now, Wayne actor. Yeah. Evil Wayne. Well, let me tell you, Evil Wayne, that, um, having a switch from being an actor where people wait on you hand and foot, Mr. Shepard, uh, would you like your breakfast burrito? How's your coffee? Do you like your trailer? Okay. Do we fix the air conditioning? Would you like anything from, you know, moving from that position, even on a Friday the 13th, they were com- concerned about your health. And if you were cold becoming a producer, after going through that is the most humbling experience you can possibly imagine where you're now waiting hand and foot on perhaps people you don't respect, don't respect you, don't like you, were your best friend before you hired them. And then the minute you hired them, they think, where's my trailer? My hotel sucks. You know, the food is cold. The coffee's bad. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, I did this guy a huge favor or I give this woman a huge break and she's like not going to come to set tomorrow because I wouldn't get her an adjoining suite where she could work out in one room and smoke in the other. I'm like, what is the world coming to? Yes, every actor I've ever worked with has been trouble, including <laughs> myself. Um, I mean, I have I have vacuumed rooms in hotels because somebody wasn't happy with the room they were in and needed another room. I have met people at the airport and walked them from one gate to the other because they were worried they'd get lost. I remember <laughs> we worked with Jim Caviezel, who I love and uh, is a good friend. You know, he was in The Passion of the Christ. He played Jesus and he was, uh, of course, in High Frequency and Count of Monte Cristo. And uh, we did a movie together in Jordan. And uh, I was in Jordan. And quite honestly, it was a little frightening. You know, I mean, it was right. It was a few years after 9-11, but we're doing a film about a stoning in a Muslim country. And I have the producer of The Passion of the Christ, you know, kind of coming in with a cross on the shield. And Jim Caviezel, who played Jesus, going into a Muslim country to do a movie about stonings. And uh I'll never forget, Jim came to the airport and he said, uh, I'm a little nervous about this whole thing. Did you, you've been over to Jordan, was it, was it safe? And I said, well, I, it was, I felt safe. And he goes, I mean, I'm, I'm, I played, am I gonna be okay? And I said, Jim, you know what, I'm John. I'm a Baptist. You're Jesus. I just prepared you the way of the Lord. You're going to be fine, dude. And he <laughs> laughed and he went. But every actor from one of my favorite actors is Michael Bean. You might remember him from Alien. He did a movie for us and uh, he was tough to work with. I couldn't afford him, but he liked the script and he has young boys. And he said, you know, I, I might do this. And I said, but we can't afford you. You know, we don't have enough money. He goes, you know, John, you put a gun in my hand. You have an alien chase me. You make me sweat. You're going to pay. But this is something my boys can see. I'll do it. And he did it for like scale. So that was a dream. But there's another B side of the album with, with Michael. He can be very difficult. So I have learned the hard way. I'm not going to say bad, anything bad about any particular actor I've ever worked with, but they've all been trouble. <laughs> they've all <laughs> actors by nature. We are a little bit full of ourselves, you know, and that's why we're good is, you know, we believe and we have a lot of confidence in, in what we were created to do. And I think that's what makes Jim Caviezel interesting to watch and Michael Bean and Jim Garner and, you know, different people I've had the, the pleasure of uh, having on set and producing. 
All right, so we have just a few more fan questions here. Sheev Palabine wants to know, uh, what was the worst thing that occurred to you during the filming of Friday the 13th? The worst thing that occurred to me during the filming of Friday the 13th? Well, I think it was when I got the script, I didn't know I was going to actually have to wear the mask, that I would be behind a door with a knife, that I would become Jason, really. And of course, they hadn't worked that out yet. It was just the ending of the film. And I realized... Okay, I, the, you, Bill gave me a little trouble before. You said you know you're being very transparent. I'm, I'm. Look, I'm here for you guys. This is an opportunity. I'm going to just bear my soul. You know, um, who I was, who I am. At the time that I got Friday the Thirteenth, I was volunteering up at a local church with the junior high kids and taking them on, you know, ski trips and Sunday mornings and hanging out with them and just being a big brother. You know. When I got Friday the 13th and I started volunteering at the Camarillo State Mental Institution, it was all good until the movie came out. And then one of the moms saw my picture in the LA Times. I think it was a full page ad of me with a machete. And it said something like, if Jason still haunts you, you're not alone. And there's John Shepard, the youth leader at the church with a machete dripping blood. And she wrote me a letter and she said, you know, John, um, kids love you. I love you. And you're a terrifically talented actor, but it's hard to imagine Sunday mornings, you're teaching the kid about God and love and Saturday night, you're in the the paper with a machete. And uh, it was a humbling sort of moment of well, what kind of a positive influence am I having on these kids? Is this, am I being a bad example? And it actually, of course, the kids loved it, but the parents were a little nervous about it. But that was also a defining moment where uh, it occurred to me, like, if I become Jason and possessed in part six, part five was good. I'm the good guy. I kick Jason's butt. He dies. I'm the hero. I live. I'm one of the few people that survive. But what's going to now? Where do I go? And that's where I really felt convicted, if you will, as an artist and as an actor and as a person of faith going, I don't know if I can do this. I, in fact, I don't know if I can do this business because I'm being paid to say something somebody else has written. I have no control over my destiny. I have to ask permission to do it. And then I have to do exactly what they tell me. I'm like a robot and I'm, I'm out of here. But the cool thing was once I let go of that desire to be famous and a celebrity and gosh, I hope I get an episode of Charles in charge or whatever my dream was at the time, <laughs> I fell into producing by just sort of, and I realized now I have opportunity to influence culture and what people say. And I can be the one that says we're doing this and we're not doing that. And it showed me that whatever gifts you have, whatever talents you've been given, and everybody has, we all have some talents or some abilities that nobody else has. And I used to think, oh, I can't be an actor and a person of faith because they're incompatible. And again, it was, you want to make God laugh? You just tell him what's impossible. He was like, now I'm going to show you what's possible. I'm going to actually redeem whatever gifts, talents that I've given you. And you're going to do films that honor and somehow glorify me. I'm like, what? How does that work? And suddenly I'm producing movies and I've done some R-rated tough stuff like the stoning of Soroya M. But it's about, again, why am I doing it? Who's my audience? I'm doing this for the real. I'm doing this for the revenue. I'm doing this for the relationship. But I'm also hopefully over the course of my life, leaving a body of work, a legacy of stuff that makes people think that engages like guys like you doing a cool podcast, talking about art. And, you know, look, you may not, everybody may not like what I have to say. They may not agree with me. They may hate Christianity or faith or have a different point of view, but we have dialogue. That's cool. That's what life's about, that we engage. What I hate about this current politics and culture is we can't talk to each other anymore. It's like, I don't agree with you, so you can't sit at the table. What? <laughs> Not America. I mean, we need to have heated debate. We need to, But at the end of the day, we're still all Americans or we're still all film fans or we're still all, you know, creative humans that have some modicum of, of respect for one another. And that's what I love about the arts and film and this podcast is you've given me a chance to engage with you guys. You don't know me from Adam. I could have been, you know, a, whatever. And maybe I am, but <laughs> you know, we're connecting on a level and we're talking about stuff that I think is, we have common interest in and finding those areas. Um, I think that's what life's about that kind of relationship. And, and I'm sorry, I dismissed that earlier in my, in my ego and pride. No, it's all good. Yeah, like you said, uh, we can all get along, you know, even though we have differences like Bill, he's a Trump supporter and uh, we still do this <laughs> podcast. 
I had no idea. <laughs> oh my God. Your point is really well made, though. You, you The fandom is, is kind of one of those things that now that I'm thinking it through a little bit, like, yeah, we, we do argue. We do debate about things. You know, you said earlier uh, you recognize that some people weren't the biggest fan of your film because of the surprise ending. But yeah. we still love it. We still love each other. We still get along and love the debate. It's friendly. It's not ever ugly going to the conventions is meeting people from all over the country like i said all different points of view and you meet people that are way into the gore and the you know I, i've seen every one of them and they know the lines and you meet people that are like well i actually my dad's a minister and i was forbidden to watch r-rated films but i really i just like this it's like a roller coaster and i love the thrill of these friday you meet so many different people and you realize there's a respect there's a love there's a mutual sort of comment this is a this is a a, a thing we gather around and celebrate it's uh you know i've stayed out late with some of the folks and cut a Friday the 13th cake with a machete and had a beer and danced. And it's like, these are people, this is a fun kind of opportunity to come together around, you know, now it's eighties kitsch at the time. It was just Friday the 13th, but it's just, you know, I've gone to conventions where I've sit with other actors from the eighties from judge Reinhold um, to the star of, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, you, you, there's a kind of a cool era of movie making that, man, I'm so, I don't want to look back and go, I'm embarrassed by that film. Oh, it was, it was a special moment in time that we got to participate and interact with these, some people I'll never see again, you know, Melanie Kenneman or Danny or, or uh, Shavar or, or Miguel Nunez. But some of these people I've maintained a friendship, Eddie Matthews and Dick Warlock. And, you know, it was like, that was a special time of life, um, a rite of passage, uh, a journey where, I was changed as a result of working on that. And I don't regret, regret that for a second. It was a great learning experience. Very cool. Our last fan question here, and it's one that we got a lot of, uh, uh, what is your favorite horror movie of all time? Well, I have to say um, the one that freaked me out the most was The Shining when it came out. And actually, one of the conventions I went to, there were two little girls dressed up like the twins. And it was still kind of freaky. But Jack Nicholson in that movie was terrifying. And I don't know if it holds up. Some of these movies you look at 30 years later and you go, it's not as scary. But at the time... He was the most disturbing Friday night. Here's Johnny. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, what could be more terrifying than Jack Nicholson? So that's kind of probably one of the, for me, the high bar. I, you know, I had friends that were in the nightmares uh, on Elm Street. And um, certainly I, I, I was impacted and seen films that were inappropriate way before I was 17. But I think probably trying to think i never did see the exorcist when i was growing up just because the music tubular bells freaked me out and i was thinking this could be real this is like the devil's real but i would say the shining is probably the the gold standard for me cool very cool john we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this and uh let's talk yeah. about let's talk about flesh and blood a little bit so uh I watched it uh, before our interview here uh, a little earlier in the day, and uh, it's only six minutes long. And uh, I, I live in a, I live in a fairly big house here that was built in 1906, and uh, I've been doing a lot of work. We're trying to we're trying to sell it, and today I w after I watched that, I went down in the basement and I was uh, I was painting the walls, and I was like, you know, it's storming outside, and I just watched your uh, your little six minute video, and I was like you know what, I'm going upstairs <laughs> and uh, where it's, where it's a little more light. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely just for, for the short amount of time that it is, it's got that definite, definite, uh, you know, creepy horror feel to it, man. It's uh, beautiful stuff. photography as well. I mean, it is a, a very atmospheric six minutes. Thank you. Well, those are young guys. Like I said, um, you know, uh, film grad, film school grads, but the music, I mean, when the attention to detail, the cameras, the lighting, um, the actors that they got, I mean, everybody in there is somebody that's doing something. It was kind of neat to work with them all. But I just, I love that, uh, look, when I was growing up, making movies required, you had to get a 
a film camera and develop film, you know, you know, when my first film was shot on 35, it was very expensive, half a million dollars to make a movie. What's cool is people can no longer use this as an excuse. I don't have the money. I don't have the, you know, it's like, you've got an iPhone, you can shoot a film. And these guys, they, they with just six minutes in a free house created this world and this story. And now they're looking for, we don't want to write it. We want to put it out there. And we're looking for people that actually know this genre really well to pitch us. And we're going to hire somebody to write a screenplay. So I think that's kind of cool is it's an opportunity to do something that would be, I mean, it's going to be more of a psychological thriller, but I'm intrigued by the idea. There was a book we, we all read when we were younger called this present darkness, which was sort of about this spiritual domain and the invisible warfare that's going on all around us. And it's like, that's kind of cool. Somebody that can see, that and the camera is a window into it so it's fleshandbloodmovie.com and it's just the trailer for what could be a film but we don't have the script yet so that's what will be our next challenge is raising the money and hiring somebody to write our idea into a full-length feature well you've made a lot of people happy doing this uh this interview with us today thank you very much where else can people find you are right, instagram twitter do you play on social media at all yeah, I really don't do very much of any of that, but um, I think um, probably the best thing is just keep an eye out for our, our next projects. You know, I have a film out right now called Emmanuel. You can go to Emmanuel Movie, E-M-A-N-U-E-L, EmmanuelMovie.com um, and check that out. And then just keep an eye out. We'll, uh, you know, I'll try and put up some stuff on Instagram, but I'm, I'm pretty much... Uh, a non-social media guy. I'm like, every once in a while, we're going to do something. Now we got to promote it. Okay. I'm going to get a bunch of you guys that are, are super active to talk about it and discuss it. And even to hear that this movie and this podcast tonight, it's being discussed on Reddit is humbling and exciting. So thanks for all you guys have done to sort of honor my time. And, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. Great, John. Did we cover everything that you were hoping we'd cover? And more. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry, I'm uh, probably more verbose than you were expecting. But, no, no, you know, no. This is I perfect. didn't get to talk in the movie, so now I'm making up for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, enough, man. This was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Keep up the good work. Thank you, John. Thank you. Chief, what's wrong? No sense of humor? Can't you take a joke? Sleep. No. Yeah, me neither. You know, we don't have to stay here. Maybe we could just hire somebody. I think it'd be a lot easier. I know. How long was she sick? She wasn't sick. I thought, I thought you said they put her in that hospital or whatever. She wasn't sick. Good. I mentioned Oliver North. You've been following this saga? This gets more bizarre every day. Now we're finding out that...